versatile a range of very interesting tales. I mentioned the fact about him being a natural scientist. His uh, PhD was on mucus. Uh, you can ask him about that uh, at question time. I don't know uh, anything more about that than what I read on the piece of paper. Uh, but he's a natural scientist of note. Yet, this evening, and in the next few evenings, he's going to be talking about the interconnectedness of the universe. In other words, what binds us as humans and as beings, what we have in common. And I, I uh, venture to say that uh, the topicality uh, and the relevance of what he's going to say couldn't be more important at a time when we have, uh, even looking abroad, uh, somebody holding an office that, that used to be regarded as, a, as part of the leadership of the, of the free world, uh, uttering the kind of things that President Trump mentioned last week, and looking closer to home, we live in a deeply uh, disturbed and challenging environment where difference is too often played upon uh, for, uh, I would suggest, uh, uh, unjustified purposes rather than justified purposes. With that, uh, it gives me enormous pleasure to hand over to Professor Anwar Moore. I know he will keep you spellbound uh, for the next few evenings. Thank, Thank you, you very you. much. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming. Quite a few familiar faces. Can you hear me? No? You can. How about now? Better? Okay. Thank you. Stop me if you can't hear me. So I was saying thank you for coming. Uh, I really always look forward to doing summer school lectures, and last year I think we did the cell, if I remember, and that, was, that, that went very well. Um, but this year I've chosen a topic, um, interconnectedness, because I've always been interested in these very big ideas, and ideas that pervade throughout the universe, and, 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 and sort of, in a way, connect not only humans to each other, but humans to other animals, and animals to rocks, and us to the universe. We, all of us, made of cosmic dust. And, and these ideas have been quite prevalent for a time. I must warn you that when I got into preparing this, um, my first talk, uh, when I finished it, had 150 slides. Uh, and so cutting down was, was, was tougher than actually preparing the talk. Uh, there is so much to say. Um, I'm a bit disappointed because I thought it was my original idea, but you'll soon learn that it wasn't. Um, but but, but I, I, as I was going through it, I was able to, to sort of revise many of my own ideas. Um, I just want to apologize to the specialists in the audience that I'm going to actually make things very basic because I think at a very basic level. So I'm not going to put up any uh, serious formulae. I'm going to actually talk to you about these ideas as we go along. But I also want to remind you that we haven't reached the end. When we talk about interconnectedness, we're talking about how science sort of relates seemingly disparate ideas. But during the next few days, you'll find that there are still huge gaps, like tomorrow we'll be discussing science and spirituality. On Thursday we'll be talking about uh, uh, you know, the mind and the brain. These divisions still persist right into the 21st century. So although we know so much, there, are, there is a resistance to linking certain of these ideas. But we'll do that as we go along. So let's go. So I've always had a passion for building blocks. Uh, in the modern, in the modern, in these times, they, call, they would call me a reductionist, and I had an obsession. You know, I have a condition, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder. 
I think I inherited it from my mother. So every night I would check my door seven times or nine times. When my children were young, I would go and see if they were well covered. And then I'd get into bed and said, oh, was her toe sticking out? Let me go and see. So it, it, it's been like this. And so even with these ideas, when something strikes me, then I become so passionate about it that I sort of get into it with a vigor. So I began, when, when I started seeing these connections, I used to make these ridiculous links, like, hey, I'm related to my shirt, in a funny sort of way. Or if I sat on a bus, I'm related to that bus driver, and, and that kind of thing. So it was Aristotle who first said, all matter in the universe is made up of four different elements. <coughs> earth, air, fire, and water. And matter was continuous and could be broken limitlessly. But it was about 2,500 years ago that a, a Greek philosopher, Democritus, said that if you broke something down, you'll reach an indivisible unit, and that's an atom. And you can't go any further. <coughs> and so many, so many years later, sorry about my cough, so many, so many years later, Albert Einstein in 1905 put some pollen grains into a beaker of water and he watched them bounce around and he said they are bouncing against moving atoms. So he was the first one to actually give it a scientific bent. Right. So what is the basic particle of the universe and why is it important? Well, the descent to minutissima, the search for ultimate smallness in entities such as electrons, is a driving impulse of Western natural science. <coughs> it is a kind of instinct. People want to know this huge universe, but what's it made of right at the basic level? <coughs> so human beings are obsessed with bu bu building blocks, forever pulling them apart and putting them together again. So the impulse goes back as far as 400 BC to Democritus to Democritus, and we've just spoken about him, and he realized that matter is made of atoms. Now, reduction to microscopic units has been richly consummated in modern science, and that I got from Edward Wilson, who's my favorite scientist, and I've always mentioned him in my talks, but this time I'll be actually doing one of his books in detail. So everything is made of atoms, and the cell is the basic unit of living matter, and when the, when the power of these statements hit me, ladies and gentlemen, when the power of these statements hit me, I, I was really taken aback. I said, oh my God, what have I been missing? Because my, the teacher might have mentioned it to me when I was in grade 10 or grade 11, and I just wrote it down in my notebook. But I didn't understand this. And, and, and this is why, I suppose in a way, I'm avenging myself for my past stupidity. So. Now, in my experience, um, of course, you know, we always have, so we're, when you're in school, um, you know, things probably don't go too well. Uh, we had some teachers who killed your joy for knowledge and, and others who tried very hard. Uh, I was reading uh, the autobiography of Richard Dawkins the other night, and he said, um, knowledge is wasted on the young. He had the best private education anybody could have. But he learned nothing because he, he wanted to be one of the boys, you know, and he wanted to show everybody that he, he didn't do things like learning. That was for, you know, for people with, 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 who were lesser beings. And he said he came from the school and he had all these opportunities, but he hardly ever used it. And of course, I, I grew up in a very religious com uh, community, so science wasn't discussed. But something happened once, and that is I went to a friend's place uh, where they had a lot of books. And I pulled out this book from the shelf while I was waiting for him. And it was the biography of Marie Curie. And I was absolutely entranced. I, I read about her. Uh, it was by her daughter, Eve Curie. I read about her two Nobel Prizes. I read about her husband, Pierre Curie, who actually wrote in one of his letters, women of genius are rare. He wouldn't have gotten away with it in the world today. A poor man was crossing a road and a carriage hit him and, uh, and crushed his skull and his brains were lying in the road and you just think, oh my God, what a good brain to waste. So there was no science in my school and then when I came to university I was hijacked by a group of Marxists 
who said to me, so what have you read? And I said, Time magazine. Oh, capitalist, are you? Well, come, let us teach you. Let, let us teach you something. Uh, and, and so they gave me books by Franz Fanon and Time Longer Than the Rope by Eddie Rue. And my world began to open up because when I was in my little village, there was, uh, you know, I was so protected. In, in, in Muslim communities, you are so protected. And Muslims focus so much on religion that they don't even bother about what's going on out there. Hey, you know, my parents never mentioned apartheid to me. It, it wasn't a factor in their lives that we were living in a group area. So it only occurred to me at university that I had come out of a fragmented and a broken society. Uh, and I began to ask the question, why? And that why spilled into my work. I suddenly became an interested student. Because I used to stand in the chemistry lab and shake that test tube and watch the color change and say to myself, oh, now is this reaction relevant to my life? Of course, it's an acid-base reaction. And in physiology, we learned the importance of acid-base reaction. So what I'm doing is very relevant. It is relevant to my life. So, uh, some many years later, this man, Jostein Gardner, wrote this book, Sophie's World. I'm sure many of you have come across it. And he asked, so, so, so what's important to people? You know, people who seek meaning in life. Um, they, 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 go, they might turn to religion. Those who are hungry, the most important thing for them is to eat. Those who are cold seek warmth. Those who are lonely seek company. But what if you've satisfied all your needs? You know, Dennis Davis, Judge Dennis Davis was on the radio recently. And he was speaking about this. He says, you know, even when you're living in a society, like say Norway, where everything works, there's no real problems. Um, and, 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 and people are still dissatisfied. Even people living in, 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 in high society, say, in the United States of America, they've got everything, the material things, but they're dissatisfied. They always say, there's something missing in my life. And, and Justin Gardner says, it's because we don't ask ourselves, why are we here? What is the meaning of this life? And once we've asked ourselves those questions, we don't explore. And I think in that sense, I've been quite fortunate uh, although I spent my life in, 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 in sticky mucus, um, I had the privilege of being in this amazing institution, the University of Cape Town, which I actually call my university. And as Hugh Corder said, that I have been an institutional servant. I've been a warden for 26 years. I didn't have to do it. In some of the toughest residences. But it was a service. But, and it enriched my life. Because I came across the lives of people who didn't have. I considered myself absolutely privileged in their presence, although I didn't come from a rich home. I considered myself, I, I, I suddenly uh, acquired a sense of gratitude that I had so much compared to others. So, 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 so these questions, these big questions become important. And it, Albert Einstein, he said, it is a wonderful feeling to recognize the unity of a complex of phenomena that to direct observation appear to be quite separate things. And I think a lot of these scientists pursued that. Um, but my idea was born um, some time ago when I read a, a, a review, uh, um, an article by Ian McEwan in The Guardian. Uh, and Ian McEwan um, uh, lamented the fact that People don't read. And uh, when they do read, they read fiction, which is fantastic. Uh, he's a writer of fiction. But he said there's a, a, a parallel genre um, of literature that was not reaching the public. And he was talking about the popular science literature. And the question he asked is, why is the general public, especially the lay public, reluctant or hesitant to engage with modern scientific ideas. Now, this is a very important question. It was asked by other scientists. Ursula Goodenough, in her sake, I must be careful of time because I have a tendency to go on and on. But just a little diversion. Ursula Goodenough, a scientist who wrote The Sacred Depths of Nature, said that we, we watch a beautiful sunset. 
When we look at the expanse of the, of the ocean on a hot day and say, wow, that's marvelous. But if we, we don't want to question as to how that sunset came about, what he's like. And she said people feel, and many people feel, that when you start asking questions like that, you tend to lose the significance of the beauty of a sunset or a bird in a bush. And, 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 and that's a pity, because Richard Dawkins has argued that this is when you realize the science behind the natural phenomena, it becomes even more beautiful. And I hope I can convince you of that as we go along. So this was the book that McEwen wrote, um, and it was an example of medicine in literature. And it, it was absolutely fabulous, because he used this book, he used this book to, to, to talk about brain surgery uh, and to talk about diseases of the brain in his story. He created characters that who had these diseases. And, 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 and uh, there was a neurosurgeon whom he followed for two years. And he said, he sat in the corner with his notebook and pencil. Uh, he didn't flinch in theater. Uh, he had several medical doctors and surgeons to review the book for accuracy. And in that book, the narrator of the book, who is a surgeon, comes across a thug who wanted to harm him. And while he's having this interaction with this thug by the name of Baxter, he realizes that this man's problem is due to the fact that he's got Huntington's chorea, which is an incurable disease which eventually kills you if you have the gene. And, and, and so this whole thing is a, a good example of how literature can be used to educate the public about science and matters, or, or matters of science. Um, Another book by Kashuo Ishiguro, who just won the Nobel Prize for Literature. This was the most disturbing book. I was on a flight from London to Johannesburg, I think, and I decided, oh, I'm going to relax with this book. And I'll tell you, halfway through the flight, I wanted to put it down. It is about a, a, a school in which young children were being cultivated to, to donate organs for cloning purposes. I mean, it, it, was, it was actually very sad, but it, it, it actually it, it had a realistic touch to it, because it was, it was actually telling you that this is the way the world could go. It was very scary. And then, of course, Richard Dawkins has to have the last word. And he's just written a book called Science in the Soul, the selected writings of a passionate rationalist. And he asks, why can't a science writer be nominated for the Nobel Prize in Literature. For God's sake, they gave it to Bob Dylan. Why can't a science writer? And he says, no scientist has won the Nobel Prize for Literature. Why not? I suspect that it simply hasn't occurred to the judges. Literature automatically conjures novelist or poet. Yet, could there be... Now, my bias will, 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 will be revealed here. Could there be a better subject for great literature than the space-time fabric of the universe, or than the evolution of life, or Sherrington's enchanted loom of the brain? At very least, it is not obvious why fiction should make greater literature than reality, and science is the study of the real world. A Nobel Prize for literature? Now, there's a life's challenge for an aspiring science writer. Now, I think Richard wants to be nominated for the Nobel Prize. But, having said that, tongue in cheek, I must tell you, he writes absolutely beautifully. Uh, in, 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 and he's not the only one. Stephen Jay Gould, the late Stephen Jay Gould of Harvard, Raymond Tallis of Manchester, Stephen Rose of the Open University, when they write their science books, they write absolutely beautifully. So I, I, I would agree with this. Now, Ian McEwen was asked to, 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 to make a list of his, um, the best books, uh, scientific books that he thinks would be very good. And I've, I've, I've just mentioned some in red because they come up twice. I mean, Richard Dawkins' Self is The Shelf is Gene was a watershed book in the history of biology. I think it, it changed the trajectory of modern biology. Um, so that was Ian McEwen, a writer. And then the other list was by Steven Weinberg, um, the Nobel laureate on making science accessible from Ptolemy to Darwin to Dawkins. And there's a few overlaps 
but you would notice that he has gone for the heavy sides rather than you know, the, the lighter side of it. Uh, and then I asked myself, if I were asked, what would I say? So I decided not to think about it. I decided to just put down on the slide the first few books that came to mind, the ones that I've read and that have probably influenced my thinking so much. Of course, Hawkins' Brief History of Time, which I bought in Hong Kong in 1988 and carried in my pocket every time I traveled, and I still have it, and it's in tatters. And it's this thin, and they say it's the most bought book and the least read one, and I can tell you that every time I open it and read a paragraph, I learn something new. Absolutely fascinating. And of course, um, Schrodinger's What is Life, which we will be discussing tomorrow or the day after. The Selfish Gene, as I mentioned, by Richard Dawkins. And of course, my favorite, favorite scientist is Edward Wilson, who wrote Consilience. So why interconnectedness? Now, I want to actually um, make an admission to you here. What happened to me is, when I said I'm going to do this series of talks on interconnectedness. Um, I was sitting, I think it was on the, on 9-11, oh my God, I didn't realize that has some uh, uh, symbolic uh, uh, significance. Uh, on, 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 the, on, the, on the 9th of September, uh, November um, last year, I was sitting in my office, um, sort of just, you know, surfing the net, as they say, and I came across this book by Peter Watson. Intellect, who was an intellectual historian, and I have read his books. I've read Ideas, A History from Fire to Freud. I've read A Terrible Beauty. Brilliant books. Brilliant. He had written a book called Convergence, The Idea at the Heart of Science. And I read on. I read on and, uh, that about, I uh, sort of went into the book, and then I realized, my God, he's stolen my ideas. I wanted to talk about interconnectedness. And in that he said, uh, beginning in the 1850s, for besides the Crystal Palace at all that it represented, that, deca that decade, the 1850s, saw the emergence of the two most powerful unifying theories of all time. Now, as I told you earlier, I've got OCD. I know the meaning of convergence, but I wanted to see the word interconnectedness. Then I knew we'd be on the same, same page. And he says, lower down, the way one sign supports and interconnects with another. And I was absolutely relieved. So as angry as I was with him for stealing, having stolen my idea, I was very relieved. And then I actually said, oh my God, now, where am I going to find this book? Because my time is running out for summer school. So the first thing I thought of, well, I'm having friends coming from London, I will phone them right now. But I just decided to phone the book now. And I asked the young lady at the other end of the line, do you have Convergence? And she said, let me have a look. And she said, is it by Peter Watson? And I said, yes. She says, yes, I have three copies. I said, my God, I love, you for, I love you forever if I can get a book. And I left my office and ran down, and I was there 10, 10 to 7 in the evening, and I got the book. And I, and I started reading it immediately. And, and the back jacket says that... In this groundbreaking book, Peter Watson identifies one extraordinary master narrative, capturing how the sciences are slowly resolving into one overwhelming, interlocking story about the universe, right? And then he goes on to say, it reveals how each piece falls into place and how each uncovers an emerging order. Convergence as Steven Weinberg, the Nobel laureate, says, is the deepest thing about the universe. And Watson's comprehensive and eye-opening book argues that all our scientific efforts are indeed approaching unity. Absolutely fantastic. You're supposed to be jumping and, and, and shouting. OK. Imagine this. I know Lisa Randall's works. I mean, she's a physicist at Harvard. Then she writes this book, Dark Matter and the Dinosaurs. And look, she's a theoretical physicist at Harvard, uh, working in particle physics and cosmology. She's a professor. And she says that Dark Matter and the Dinosaurs, the astounding interconnectedness of the universe. So I was on the right track. Would you agree? Yes. Good. OK. So where does it lead us to a unified, 
ordered historical account of the universe we inhabit and our own place within that totality. And the narrative of the universe that has emerged is all the more impressive because to begin with at least no one went looking for it. It helps us create a world view, right? But the warning I gave you earlier, please bear in mind, we haven't quite reached the ultimate destination. There are still a lot of divisions. But the great convergence, whilst John Herschel thought that gravitation was the single principle which pervades all nature, and I think he was right, it's one of the principles, and connects together the most distant regions of space as well as the most remote periods of duration. Watson believes that the conservation of energy and the theory of evolution by natural selection were the fruit of the coming together of several sciences in this fascinating de decade of the 1850s, the most exciting intellectual breakthroughs of all time. The way one science supports and interconnects with another is the beginning of a form of understanding like no other in history. Okay, so imagine now. Let's just take these two enormous topics, the conservation of energy and the evolution and natural selection. Conservation of energy itself involved other sciences of heat, optics, electricity, magnetism, food and blood chemistry. Evolution and natural selection involved deep space astronomy, deep time geology, paleontology, geography, and biology. There's a synthesis in the sciences. And please forgive my bias, but that synthesis is not happening in other fields of knowledge. It is being tried. There have been a few successes. We'll talk about that. But in science, there is a synthesis which Edward Wilson calls the consilience. Okay. Now, there's another great synthesis that took place in the, in the 20th century, and that was between Darwin's theory of evolution and modern genetics. Now, Charles Darwin wrote the origins in 1859. He didn't know what the unit of heredity was. He talked about variation, but he didn't know what a gene was. He talked about the blending of characteristics, okay? And that, that's an absolute surprise, because not far away in Austria, Gregor Mendel was doing the experiment. Biology became, a unify, became unified with physics and chemistry, and Wilson will call that a consilience. Unlocking the secret of the gene was the birth of molecular biology. That became the commonality of life at a molecular level. Now, this is the book that would give you the history of modern molecular biology. It's written by Horace Freeland Judson, who died a few years ago. I paid all of one dollar for this book. Okay, now, Watson's choice, conservation of energy and evolution. The idea of the conservation of energy brought together discoveries in the sciences, um, but I wanted to, sorry, I just wanted to read to you something here. This is the book. And Darwin's theory of evolution brought together all these um, different disciplines that I've listed here. But look at this, the interconnectedness of psychology and physics. That is absolutely amazing. And it says here, as this book was being finalized, there came the news that researchers has, had inserted two small silicon chips into the, the posterior parietal cortex of a tetraplegic individual, right? Now, when they did that, based on previous work on animals, which guided the researchers to the specific area of the human brain, they found that they could reliably read out where the patient intended to move his paralyzed arm by an analyzing the different patterns of these hundred cells, okay? Once they found that information, the specificity of this experiment and the fact that it could throw light on the intention, on the intention of the subject, not just the actual movement, 
but on the intention, the very thought, offers great hope for the future. But from our point of view, it takes reductionism to a new level, uniting still further psychology and physics. So interconnectedness is becoming an amazing idea. Okay? So prior to the 1850s, there were a lot of great minds that walked this earth. We had the Ionian enchantment in ancient Greece. We had Copernicus, Ke Johannes Kepler, Galileo Galilei, and Newtonian astronomy. Then the Royal Society was created in the 1660s. But the great, great convergence begins in the 1850s when two of the most powerful theories of science were connected. Okay. Now, it was in this decade that interconnections and overlaps between various disciplines first started to show themselves in two fundamental areas, adding a whole new dimension to science. The 1850s were the most momentous decade in the annals of science, with the greatest intellectual breakthroughs of all time. Can you hear me? Okay. The realization of the way one science supports another, the beginning of a form of understanding like no other. This was in every way a new era intellectually. Our own George Ellis says it all started with physics. Physics, physics underlies the mind, then George usually gets a little cautious. He says physics can explain most things, but not everything. Now, look at this, this thing called physics, this subject. It's an amazing subject. You have classical physics. I mean, the big shot there was Isaac Newton his calculus, his laws of motion, the law of universal gravitation, and a whole lot of other, other subjects. Chaos theory, thermodynamics, which we are going to talk about now. Now, that's classical physics, and it's called classical physics because it's now a little bit of old hat after Albert Einstein came along and talked about relativity, okay? And he gave us two theories, the general theory of relativity and the special theory of relativity. Now, when I was thinking about this, there's a lot of people who still, still consider relativity as part of classical physics. But when I was thinking about this, if you think of the meaning of the term relative, opposed to absolute, and to talk about relativity, which we will talk about uh, in the week, you, you, you wonder exactly what is happening here. It was Einstein who actually was thinking along the lines that will eventually take us to the point of where we are today. But when he realized that at a certain point, he became absolutely uh, resistant to the idea. And, 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 and we'll talk about it. But just using the term relativity gives you a hint of the way physics was going to go in the future. Because from relativity, we came down to quantum physics. Now, this classical physics discusses the big universe. Like somebody said, gravitation would be the principle that would link everything in that universe. Okay. Now, up to here, this gray part and right down to classical physics, everything was fine. In fact, somebody commented, that is the end of physics. There is nothing more we need to know. But they were wrong. Because at the beginning of the 20th century came this field, quantum physics. And this makes me nervous. Because it is said that anybody who says that she or he understands quantum physics is lying. Nobody understands it except two or three people. In fact, when Sir Arthur Eddington um, of Cambridge University uh, had, had, had realized the implication of Albert Einstein's theory of relativity, um, he was told, so just the two of you in this world understand this? He says, well, I wonder who the other one is. <laughs> so so it, it, these areas, I'm not a physicist. I did physics one at university. But this is absolutely enchanting. And of course, when you come to a point like this, where you can't relate classical to quantum. There's this huge gap. We're talking about interconnectedness. We can't connect it. Then you talk about the chasm of ignorance, 
And of course, the philosophers have a field time against the scientists. And then there are issues of the future like dark matter and dark energy. And everybody who is somebody in the physics world is pursuing this quantum gravity which would combine classical physics to quantum, to quantum physics. So we're not quite there yet, but we have come very far, and I want to tell you about that. So the standard model of physics today is the theory describing three of the four known fundamental forces, the electromagnetic, the weak, and the strong intera interactions. And those three relate to the atom and the subatomic realm. We'll talk about that. Not including gravity. We cannot link gravity to the other three. And of course, we've also classified all the known elementary particles. OK. Then the other big idea, evolution, the chain of life. Look here. This is a protocell four billion years ago. Eventually, you had a cell with a nucleus and into it came a bacterium, called the mito which we now call the mit mitochondria, which said to the cell, let me stay inside you. And the cell said, I'm not particularly happy about that. And it said, well, I'll be your ESCOM. I'll be your powerhouse. And, 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 and the cell said, all right, stay. And that became the mitochondria in which our respiration actually takes place today. Okay. So from there up to here today, you are the living ancestor of an unbroken chain of life stretching from you through your mother and your grandmother all the way back through the complete history of life on planet Earth to the very first light forms that appeared around 4 billion years ago. You go all this way. Okay? Every single individual creature in that chain successfully survived for long enough to rear their young over and over again until it ended with you. It's amazing. If you read Richard Dawkins' ancestor's tale, he highlights how we have shared a common ancestry with every other living organism on this planet. Okay? So, so let's look at these big ideas. The big idea that I want to talk to you about, which I got from Watson, was the first and second law of thermodynamics. The study of transformations of energy, particularly heat into work. We're going to talk about two things today, energy and entropy. And please don't be discouraged, because I am going, I have thought about it and thought about it, and the way I've put it down here, I think would have pleased my first and second year classes in medicine, so they would please you. What is energy? Now that is a big, big question, okay? Because it is nature's currency system. It's the principle that pervades all of nature. Now Peter Atkins of Oxford says, it is very hard to give a concrete definition of energy. In school, they told us it's the ability to do work. But my friend Lutz Thilo, who's actually a physicist who taught medical biochemistry with me in medical school, used to say this is the best way to do it. He would ask the class, what is energy? And he'll get a few answers. And then he'll say to them, what is not energy? Is this energy? Yes. Is this energy? Yes. Is this water energy? Yes. Are you energy? Yes. Everything in the universe is a manifestation of energy. You sitting here in this ordered way, you're held together by energy. So if I blew you up, I would release that energy. So here you are. Now, the first law of thermodynamics says energy cannot be created or destroyed. It changes from one form to another. So the energy of the entire universe is constant. Okay? But there's a lot of exchange taking place from one form to the other. But you can't create new energy and you can't destroy existing energy. 
in such a process, when energy changes from one form to the other, you always lose some as heat. Now, take me for example. I am a manifestation of energy. Would you agree? Okay, blow me up. Go ahead, do it, blow me up. But blow me up to the point where every atom that constitutes me is released. Okay. I'll be mourned. I'll be mourned by my family for a little while. I wouldn't have left them any money, so they would probably forget me after a few weeks. But when the universe does its books, its audit, and if somebody said to the universe, Anormal is gone, the universe will say, we haven't lost any energy. Because the energy that made me has gone back into the cosmos. Okay, So it's changed from one form to the other. And some of it is lost as heat. So that energy which actually made me hasn't been actually destroyed, it just transformed. Okay, so the energy content of our universe is constant, but energy has a qualitative face that affects its efficacy. Are you with me? Okay. This is the greatest of all exa exact generalizations was the concept of energy. This is said by Theodor Mertz in the history of European thought in the 19th century. Energy cannot be created or destroyed. It changes from one form to another. It may, I believe, be demonstrated that work is lost to man irrecoverably when conduction occurs, but not lost in the material world. That's how Lord Kelvin, William Thompson, who eventually became Lord Kelvin, who even made the statement there is nothing new to discover in physics, he made the statement, and this is how he put it. That's where we got the idea of the first law of thermodynamics, that energy cannot be created or destroyed. It changes from one form to the other. Now, let's look at us. How do we live? Okay? Our ultimate source of energy is the sun. Now, look what sunlight does. It takes from the universe carbon dioxide and water and in the presence of its light energy makes an organic compound glucose and releases oxygen. Isn't that wonderful? It's called photosynthesis. You've all done it in school. Okay? Now, when I respire, I take the glucose and I break it down in the presence of oxygen to go back to water and I breathe out the carbon dioxide. I perspire or I release water and I give it back to the universe. This is a balanced equation. This happens in plants in the presence of a green pigment called chlorophyll. Now, there is a flow of this energy through the universe. The sun's energy, right? If you grasp this, you've grasped it all. The sun's energy falls on the plant, trapped by chlorophyll, right? And these plants are phototrophs. That means they like light. They grow towards light. So the sun's energy is transformed into glucose here, an organic compound, right? Energy has changed from one form to the other. First law of thermodynamics. Some of it is lost as heat. Bear that in mind. So for a natural process, you always have to associate it with it, heat loss. If that doesn't happen, the reaction doesn't take place. And that loss of heat has terrible implications for our universe, and I'm going to tell you about that now. So anyway, what happens then to this glucose? We eat it. We rely on it. Never mind what Tim Noakes says. This glucose metabolism is where we get our energy from. Don't tell Tim I said that. He's a friend of mine. So, it is eaten by us. And as I said, as that reaction said, we break it down in the presence of oxygen and we release carbon dioxide and water. This is 
the flow of energy in the universe. Okay? Now, just to remember that sun's light energy was transformed into glucose. Now, don't worry about this just yet. A decreased entropy says there's less chaos. What it means is that sunlight could be chaotic because there's millions of particles coming as part of sunlight. And then that is trapped into glucose in the tree. There is more order and less disorder in this process. That means there's a decreased entropy, which I'll talk to you about just now. But you've got to first tell me, are you with me? Okay. Now, nobody knows about the man who discovered photosynthesis. He was a Dutch scientist, and it was his 287th birthday the other day. So we say happy birthday to, to him. His name is Ingenhaus. Okay? I'm not going to say much more about him. Now, let's look at our biosphere, because this planet has life on it. We don't know if there's life anywhere else. We'd like to think there is, but thus far, we don't know. So, the energy flow through our biosphere, and the biosphere means the part of this planet that we occupy which supports life. It begins as sunlight trapped by plants in photosynthesis. So here is the sun, here is the glucose being made, energy from one form to the other, some lost as heat, and then we and the rabbits and our cats and everybody eat the glucose. We survive. Because in our bodies, that glucose is a form of energy. I always tell my students it's a form of energy, but it's not the form, it's not the form we use it in. So if I gave you $100 now, that's a lot of money, and I say, all I need is a can of Coke. You go to pick and pay, you say, look, you've got a lot of money, but it's not the right currency. That's like glucose. It's not the right currency to actually provide you, me with energy for me to be able to move my arm or to provide your brain with energy so that you can listen to me and understand me. So, we eat and then we die and we are decomposed. The predators have the best of it. And whatever we made of then is given back to the universe and then goes back into making what they originally was. This is a cycle of life. I call it the recycling of nutrients and energy flow makes life possible. The recycling of atoms. But we'll come to that just now. Okay, now, we've described energy and we've described the first law. The second law of thermodynamics is pretty disturbing, ladies and gentlemen. It's the increasing disorder or entropy of the universe. You can use that term, or you can use this disorder, or you can say the increasing chaos of the universe. Now, Stephen Hawking puts it beautifully. You know, you're sitting here, and you haven't really moved. You're all ordered. This lecture hall is ordered. None of you are saying, hey, listen, my liver is leaving me. Let me bring it back and put it back in place. You are ordered, right? And if you look around you, you see only order. So you assume that there's order everywhere. But did you know there are more disordered states than ordered ones? There is only one way to arrange the pieces of a jigsaw to make a picture. But there could be millions and millions of ways to make a disordered picture with those pieces of the jigsaw puzzle. So they are innumerable disordered arrangements one can make. This is Stephen Hawking explaining the concept of disorder to us. There is more disorder in the universe than there is order. Now, you cannot convert energy from one form to another without losing part of that energy in the form of heat. And when you release that heat, like when you take sunlight and make an ordered molecule like glucose and you lose some as heat, the atoms around that process juggle faster. Would you agree? 
you have increased the disorder of the universe. So to keep something ordered, to keep you ordered, the universe has to pay for it with disorder. Okay. Now, let's just look at this. The working of any organism requires exact physical laws. Physical law rests on atomic statistics and are therefore only approximate, right? Their precision is based on, the, on a large number of atoms intervening. Okay. Now, let's just do an experiment. Here's a beaker. Right? Of water. I, I was worried when they gave me water in this beaker. I thought it was something from the chemistry department. Now, imagine if I had to inject something into this beaker. Say a dye made up of small particles. Right? You'll see that dye coming in here, and suddenly it'll spread. All the atoms making the dye will start pervading this entire beak of water. Would you agree? Now, this is what will happen. I got this from uh, Erwin Schrodinger's book called What is Life? He was a physicist, a Nobel laureate, who contributed to quantum theory, but he wrote this book as a physicist, but trying to answer the question, what is life? Now, he says, or Lutz Thilo, my friend, used to, say, used to say to his class, these particles in the system they just move around. They have no brain, he used to say to them. They have no brain. They, they hit against the wall of the beaker. They hit against each other. You'll find one here, and then later on you'll find it elsewhere. And they'll continue their motion. Now, that is like what this universe was after it formed. A hot universe with particles flowing around. And Raymond Tallis, the neuroscientist from Manchester, asked, says, this is a miracle that this hot universe with all these atoms and particles floating around at high speeds eventually gave rise to ordered individuals who have a brain and have a consciousness and who can think about disorder in the universe. He says he, he just can't grasp. He says it's so fascinating, but he's still trying to understand it. So they move around. And when we look around, we see, no, so, so there is very little chance, yes, this is important. There is a very little chance of the particles in solution to return to the point of entry. That's not going to happen. Because once they've found their space, they just move around. Now, this man, Boltzmann, he did that experiment. He committed suicide because nobody wanted to listen to him. He injected gas into a container. He saw the disorder, the chaos, or the entropy, right? He saw the molecules distributed at random as in a cloud of dust, OK? And Peter Atkins, in his brilliant book, which I'll show you now, says they will not form themselves spontaneously into the Statue of Liberty. So how on earth did we come about? An egg does not spontaneously cook when left on a cool table. So the ordered part of the universe, how did it come about in such a disordered universe, which is increasing in disorder? Boltzmann said the physical laws rest on atomic statistics and are therefore only approximate. You cannot make any law from watching a sing the behavior of a single atom. Precision is based on a large number of atoms. There is chaos. Compare this to your own ordered state, and yet our molecules are not made up of so many atoms. This is the strangest thing that Boltzmann says, to actually understand it and to make any sense of it and to actually give it a statistical bent, you have to have millions and billions of these particles in a system bouncing around. And yet, we are so ordered and the molecules that make us, the proteins and the DNA and things like that, are little structures. They're not billions and billions of atoms. They're little structures, and they make us. And they keep us ordered. How is that possible? So this is the book from which I got these ideas. Peter Atkins was a chemist at Oxford. One of his claims to fame is that he was married to Susan Greenfield who's a neuropharmacologist of note, who wrote The Private Life of the Brain, and became the first woman president of the Royal Society. Okay. So 
he wrote this book called Galileo's Finger, The Ten Great Ideas of Science. And his chapter, chapter four, on chaos, on entropy, the spring of change, is a fascinating chapter. So if you can get hold of it, please read it. This is the picture I got from the book, shows the preserved middle finger from Galileo's right hand, which was detached from his body a century after his death and displayed to enthusiastic admirers. You can see it today at the Museum of History of Science in Florence. A singling out of truth from Galileo's little finger, the only surviving part of him. His personal existence may be transitory, but his knowledge is immortal. So, the driving force of all change in the world is the increasing disorder of the universe. Now, take me. I come into my office, it is disordered. Things are lying around. And it's always the case. My wife can't keep up with my chaos and my disorder, even in my study at home. So everything lies about. And I decide, I can't function like this, I'll have to order things. How am I able to do it? I do it. I neaten up my whole study. I neaten up my office. Right? Because I had the ability to do it. How? Because I had energy. I eat. I've got glucose in my, cyst in my cells. They make ATP. That ATP is my currency for energy. The right currency. Okay? So, I can do that, but to, able, to be able to do that, energy has been transformed from one form to another. And some of it has been lost as heat. That heat that I give off because I work so hard increases the disorder of the universe. That's the cost of us being alive. Okay? I don't know why you're not jumping up and shouting. The lower the entropy of the disorder, the higher the quality of the energy. Remember I said, everything is energy, but there is a qualitative energy, and there's one in which the quality has declined. And if you want to really think about it from an anthropomorphic point of view, you can say, the, the energy of high quality makes me, the energy of low quality makes all the movement go on in the universe. Okay. A body with its energy stored in a refined, carefully ordered way, like the glucose that we have, like books in an efficient library, has a low disorder. A body with its energy stored clumsily, chaotically, like the books in a random pile, or like my office, has a high entropy or disorder. The concept of entropy is much easier to grasp than that of energy. So says Peter Atkins. So remember, to keep you ordered and tidy, and functioning, so that you can sit here in a quiet manner and focus on the talk, you are increasing the disorder of the universe. Sorry to let you know. And this has very serious implications, because energy is being changed from one form to another, and you are giving off heat here. Okay? Now, to say that entropy never decreases in any natural change is the same as saying that molecular order, like you and me, never increases on its own accord. Order naturally decays into disorder. You're going to, you're going to become disordered. In fact, you're not becoming disordered right now because you're taking food from the universe. You are in a dynamic steady state, right? When you stop taking food, you will reach equilibrium, your energy will degrade, and it will be dispersed. Like it or not, the universe is getting worse. You and me keep away disorder right now, in our lifetimes, until the end. One day we too will degrade. You agree? We will increase the disorder of the universe. Our atoms will be gone. I mean, Bill Bryson said, some of us might have one or two of Shakespeare's atoms on our nose. You don't know. Okay. Now, the Victorians were horrified about these questions. They said, all this, these laws are okay for the steam engine, but not for us. Okay. Then why is this increasingly disordered universe, there is room for the emergence of exquisite structures of people? Note how we continually connect us to the laws of physics and of noble thoughts and deeds. 
When we ask a question like that, that in this whole universe that is tending towards disorder, you've got these exquisite structures. How come? And this is the question Raymond Tallis asks, right? So to resolve the paradox, the crucial point, and here's the point, ladies and gentlemen, I've come to it, to grasp is that no change is an island of activity. Change is a network of interconnected events. Although you drift into degradation, into disorder, into chaos, into increase in entropy, might take place in one location, the consequence of that drift might be to ratchet up a structure somewhere else. So whenever you see order emerging, lift the curtain and see greater disorder. So when you saw the Statue of Liberty emerging, think of the people who did the hard work and increased the disorder of the universe because they had to eat, make ATP, and then release some of that energy as heat. When they drove to their work, they filled their petrol tanks. They drove to their work. They used some petrol. But when they felt their bonnets, it was, it was hot. Some of that petrol was lost as heat. Okay? But they reached their destinations. We indeed, all structures, are local abatements. I didn't know the meaning of this word. It means more pleasant forms. We indeed, all structures, are local abatements of chaos. Okay? So, disorder and the arrow of time. Disorder increases with time because we measure time in the direction in which disorder increases. A glass of water on a table is ordered. Here it is. It's ordered. It falls and breaks into pieces. There's disorder. If time went backward, the full glass of water will be back on the table. Never happens. It's going in one direction, increasing disorder. The psychological error of time is in the direction of an increase in disorder. So don't hope for your fried egg to become unfried or for you to go back to your childhood and eventually become a baby and go back into your mother's womb. It's not going to happen. Okay. What a treat. The ceaseless decline in the quality of energy expressed in the second law is a spring that has driven the emergence of all components of the current biosphere. The spring of change is aimless. Now, this is a materialist speaking. I hope there's not religious people here who are offended by it. Purposeless corruption. Yet the consequences of interconnected change are the amazingly delightful and inter intricate efflorences of matter we call grass, slugs, and people. We survive at the expense of the increasing disorder of the universe. And Lewis Thomas, the science, uh, scientist who was also a writer in Late Night Thoughts in a book called Late Night Thoughts, wrote that if the universe was a rabbit, we would, be on the, we would be the fleas biting that rabbit and irritating it because the universe doesn't really want us. We are expensive to keep alive. Okay? So it's all interconnectedness again. The nuclei fuse together in the sun of hydrogen atoms to give our planet the energy to make us and to sustain the planet. Right? This is a sacrifice, according to Brian Swim, in the hidden heart of the cosmos. So what is the sun? It's just a lot of hydrogen. Now, if I have two hydrogen atoms measure, weighing one, one, and if they fuse into helium, you'd expect it to become two. One plus one is two. But it doesn't. It becomes 1.99999. What happened to the other bit? It is the sunlight, the energy that reaches our Earth to sustain us for life. George Ellis and other people called it a self-satisfying kenosis. It was this principle that pervades this universe to try and keep us alive. But the sun is also the driving force of universal corruption. For to make us, there has to be an increasing disorder. Okay? So the fate of the universe is eventually one of maximal disorder. I hope you don't leave. Is my time up? Okay. So the fate of the universe is eventually one of maximal disorder, a state of equilibrium. It's like me 
starving you to that, you reach a state of equilibrium, which we keep away from by consuming energy from the universe in the form of food, a steady state. One day, all the fuel in the sun will be exhausted. Right now, the heat of the nuclear reactions balances the gravitational attraction. When there's no more fuel, when there's no more hydrogen, when all of it is converted to helium, then the gravity of the sun will take over. The Earth will, of course, die. The sun as a star will become a white dwarf. And because of the overwhelming gravity, it will collapse. A black hole with gravity so strong that once you get in, you never come out. Okay? Now, I'm going to stop there with the bad news, but I just want to tell you something that happened in relation to this. There was a talk on this, and the speakers once said, I think the, the sun will die out in 15 billion years. There was an old man in the audience who had fallen asleep. And he suddenly woke up and he says, what did you say? And he said, I said that the sun's energy might be consumed in about 15 billion years. The old man said, oh, OK. I thought you said 5 billion years. <laughs> I think I'll stop there. I could bamboozle you with some formula, but I don't think you want it. I hope you're following me. OK. So what's going to happen tomorrow is we, each day we're going to start looking at things that haven't been connected yet. Tomorrow is going to be science and spirituality. Are you coming? Yes. Science and spirituality. <laughs>